Okay, my name's Lee Fullhart. Um, grew up around Decorah. Actually grew up in Hesper, Iowa, which is north of there, right on the border, a little small town, about 50 people. And of those 50, 11 of them were my family. So, <laughs> so we grew up small town Iowa. Um, <clears throat> graduated from Decorah, went from Decorah to University of Iowa, spent some years down there at University of Iowa. Um, and then continued to wrestle for several years. Uh, ended up in Colorado Springs for a couple of years. And then from Colorado Springs, that's where I got into Border Patrol. So I had a degree in computer system security. And so I wanted to get into federal law enforcement. And at the time, Border Patrol, they were hiring. It was a good way to get in. And, and it took me someplace I'd never been down on the southern border. Um, Definitely a culture shock just to just to be in a different part of the United States um, that I wasn't accustomed to. Uh, different different people, um, you know, in Texas. So I started my board patrol career in West Texas, and it's just a different. <clears throat> growing up there, um, seeing the people there, you you have you definitely had somewhat of a divide between your. Um, your landowner population, which is predominantly white, and your Hispanic population, which was, you know, the, was their labor force. Um, and there still was a lot of control, because in Texas, there's no, like, there's no federal land, um, which is a big difference in the West. Like, if you want to get on a land to hunt, you have to find private land, and you have to pay. So there was, there definitely was that population there of kind of the aristocrat, where they, they had a lot of power, a lot of influence in the area. So even for me as an outsider, and that's something I, I talk to kids a lot about, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with race. Like, I was not a Texan. I wasn't treated really any different than anybody else. I was an outsider. If you're not from Texas, you're a Yankee. You know, and, and that's, that's just how, that's just the culture, and that's, that's what you dive into. And, you know, the, the friends we made down there, like, you know, we had we had friends that had Hispanic heritage. We had friends that had Indian heritage from India, not Native American Indian, but you know, and some of them Native American too. And there there is uh, there's that separation, just simply because of where you're from and what you grew up with and what you're accustomed to. And you know, I had friends that were first generation um, immigrants from Mexico. You know, I had coworkers that were first generation immigrants from Mexico. Um, so West Texas work, uh, a lot of remote uh, ranch areas that we worked, mountains, pretty much everywhere where you work on the southern border, you're gonna run into mountains unless you get into South Texas. You know, South Texas, it flattens out a little bit more, a little more humid, a little, a little more heat. But, so I was in West Texas. Um, so from El Paso all the way down to Del Rio. I didn't work much over in the Del Rio area, but but I was mostly in that desert. If you've ever been Big Bend, Big Bend area, Big Bend National Park, we were down there. We, we didn't see quite as much traffic in West Texas simply because of terrain. Uh, the train's rugged. There's there's not a lot of water. You know, so the limiting factors in, in border security is is the train uh, access to water and just the ability for people to get across and transportation. There's the, <clears throat> there isn't a major interstate going through that area. Um, the interstate runs from El Paso up to Odessa, Midland area, so that's um, depending on where you're crossing, like the area I patrolled, you're talking, you know, 150 miles for somebody to get from the border up to a major highway. It's a pretty, significant deterrent. Um, <clears throat> most of what we saw crossing in that area, we, we did get some drug traffic. Uh, usually the drugs were marijuana. If it was a harder substance, it was coming through the port. It would be a concealment. Um, and there again, you look at who was doing the concealment. For us in that area, there's a, in Chihuahua, Mexico, there's a large Mennonite population they were fantastic welders and fabricators and they could make compartments and hide stuff in axles that near impossible to find. It, it, for us to find it, um, even with a dog, um, a lot of times they would, they would fabricate in one area, sanitize it, move it, 
assemble it somewhere else just to try to reduce the likelihood of contamination of the, the outside product. And it's, it's even for the dogs, it was tough for them to find. A lot of it we missed. I would say, you know, percentage-wise, I, I would say we're probably catching, if we're having really good, if we had a really good team, maybe we'd be getting 20% of what's coming through. Reality is probably 10%, like in between from, from even human smuggling to drug smuggling, we're, we're seeing maybe 10% of what's coming across the border. So right now, probably on the human traffic, we're seeing um, what we know about is probably much higher simply because the, the situation now is you just walk across and give up. There's, there's not quite the number of people coming across trying to sneak across because the reward for if you're, we call them, you know, other than Mexicans, you know, any, if you, because Mexicans we, we, we can send back. Mexicans we have um, expedited removal, voluntary removal, we can send them back pretty quick. If it's somebody Central America, farther south, or India, um, likelihood of them going back is pretty slim. So for them to get caught is not a big deal. It's easier for them to get caught and get processed and then we bust them where they want to go. Um, if you're Mexican, you know, more than likely you're going to go back. Yeah. Why is there such a difference between So part of it is the agreements we have with Mexico, um, and part of it is just locality. For us to send somebody back, like even to Guatemala, they're going to go, we're going to fly them back. Um, you, we did have, uh, through Bush's, or not Bush, um, for Trump, he did have the remain in Mexico policy, which part of that was, if you came across illegally and it was an agreement with Mexico, like, hey, we're, we're, we're sending you back to Mexico. We're able to remove. There's different, there's different methods of removal. As a Border Patrol agent, like I had the ability, if it fell within the law, to do expedited removal, which they had to be less than 15 days and it had to be less than 100 miles from the border. So if I, you were apprehended within those 15 days of entry and less than 100 miles from the border, well, then I could expedite remove you. So I was basically judge, jury, prosecutor, everything. Like, hey, I, I could determine these facts were true. And the person coming across, part of it is their statement. Their statement backs up everything we're saying, and they sign off on it, and we just we take them right back to Mexico. We take them back to the port of entry. We contact the Mexican consulate. We let them know, like, hey, we're bringing back, and we give them a list. You know, this is everybody that's coming, and we drop them off, and then they take custody of them. On that side so then once they are there it's up to the Mexican authorities to decide hey what are we going to do with them um, are they going to house them there or or for a lot of your Central Americans they will provide transportation and take them back and, and I've run into that before where in Ajo Arizona so I went from from Texas to Arizona Arizona to California and then California came back to New Mexico so I worked pretty much the whole swath of the border um, in in Arizona, working on the border, and it similar terrain, more desert. Um, big difference there was when I was in Texas, we didn't have any wall. You had the Rio Grande, but the Rio Grande at that point was where we worked a stream at best. You know, sometimes it was completely dry, so it wasn't it wasn't a deterrent. If you go down um, south of Presidio, which Presidio was our port town, you had more water flow, so you had water that was coming in from Mexico. When I was in Ajo, we didn't have a river as our border. Uh, we did have some fencing, uh, mostly just in in the small uh, little town we had there that was on the border. Um, so you you had fencing there in town, but then once you got outside, it was just uh, Normandy barrier. So kind of the big metal tic tac toe or. Uh, what do you call it? the tat, which you pick up on the ground, jacks. They look like the big jacks. Um, so, so we had those Normandy barriers that just basically to keep vehicles from coming across. Um, in, in Arizona, though, what we did have is if we knew we had people on the south side of the border, um, what we would do is we would try to keep them south, and we would call the Mexican authorities, and they would come. If it was juveniles, a lot of times they'd go pick them up, and they would give them the option and provide transportation to take them back to, to Guatemala, 
Honduras, El Salvador, wherever it was they're coming from. And a lot of them would go back. Because um, the kids that are coming up, most of them aren't coming up on their own free will. They're being told to come up. You know, and, they're, and it's part of, people don't get like, by having an open border, we're fueling, we're fueling cartels. Like nobody comes across the border without paying. You, you don't just waltz through Mexico. You know, you see on, on TV, they show these people in these big, you know, migrant caravans. It's like, well, they're not just walking through Mexico scot-free because the cartels control the border. There's, there's nobody gets across the border or comes through without permission from the cartels, and you have to pay. Every, the majority of the people I spoke to, it was between six to $10,000 to get across. And that's even those who are coming across and they walk across and they give up. They're still paying that much. And if they haven't paid that much yet, they're having to pay that once they get to where they're going. And that's usually through basically like indentured servitude. They have to work it off. In Arizona, um, big difference that we saw from Arizona to Texas because there was way there was significant more drug trafficking going through there. On the Arizona area where we patrolled, every mountaintop had somebody sitting on it. When we were out there working, there was always somebody watching us. It wasn't, um, and more than likely, we were outnumbered. Uh, when I when I worked at night, which I did a lot of the sensor work, so I would put in uh, seismic detection uh, cameras, which pretty much similar to what people put out for their deer hunting. We'd put cameras that worked off of cellular, or we had uh, we'd set up our own repeaters to to get live images off of from the field. I'd work at night because if I worked during the day, my stuff would get stolen. Like I couldn't put equipment in during the day without somebody watching and knowing where I was at, and it would it'd be gone. And then at night, usually I was by myself, um, and simply because I couldn't get very many people to do the work I was willing to do, which is kind of a state of where we're at. You know, I just didn't have people that would be willing to hike as far as I was going to hike or or do the things. Sometimes you had to climb some sketchy stuff because you had to come in a different way. Because um, if you didn't, you're going to bump into somebody. Um, and there was there were some nights, there's one in particular that I went to go put cameras in. Um, and I was, I was going into an area that I knew was a high drug traffic area. You know, and I, I knew the trails pretty well because I'd walked them. I knew where I wanted to put my camera in. And I walked in and, and um, so this is in Oregon Pipe National Park. You know, and you'd think Oregon Pipe National Park, you know, pretty, pretty neat cacti, pretty neat uh, vegetation, uh, different animals you'd see there, littered with garbage. I mean, there's, there's water jugs and trash everywhere because of the amount of traffic that's come through. And there isn't anybody who comes through behind them picking up. Well, on my way in, I kicked a water jug because it was dark and, you know, I can't use my light or they'll see me. Kicked a water jug and it was loud, and the ridge tops of where I was working, hooting and hollering everywhere, like every ridge top. I mean, I probably a dozen different people up on top of the mountains, and then I sit down. I think, well, maybe if I waited out a little bit, you know, I'll be okay. They'll forget I'm down here. And then you start hearing tumbling rocks. I was like, well, okay, so this ain't gonna work out because that's somebody coming down to come find me. Somebody's looking to see, figure out who I am. You know, and I know there's more of them than there are of me. And I'm close to the Mexican side. So if I get in a scuffle, and if I'm not winning, you know, they can always run south. And they're going to be fine. So it's time for me to get out. You know, so I am sneak my way back out, walk out nice and quiet, because i got to get back out. You know, and I'm walking six or seven miles in sometimes, you know, so I got to get back to my truck. You know, maybe I take a different route than I came in. You know, who knows how long they've been paying attention, watching, because they have night vision just like we do. They have thermal imaging just like we do. Uh, they all have radios, so they're radioing to their friends. You know, I probably was watched as I came down the border road. So they probably had an idea already that I was going to be in that area, but you get in those situations where it's like, all right, you know, this is... This is done for the night, and then you go back and do it another night, which I did go back and do it another night. You know, and, and we caught a couple groups off that. We got some marijuana off that. You know, probably, you know, you catch three or four groups before 
somebody starts coming through and your next picture is somebody doing doing this and that means they're looking they're looking for your device they know they get they get an idea of where it's at they're looking for it and so it's time to go get it otherwise it's going to go missing you know and then i got to write a memo explaining why i lost government equipment which that was part of it too we got to the point and it took us a while for for some of our supervisors to understand like hey we're going to lose 10 percent of our equipment every year like for us to be effective and do our job, you just gotta accept like, hey, ten percent of what we put out there is just gonna go missing. Now that can get frustrating when that picture is is uh, one of our friends from up north off the university that thinks that they are helping people, um, and they're out there looking for our equipment and stealing our equipment, which that happens often. Um, you know, and then they're supplying, they're putting out supplies and food and water, and they think that they're being helpful. It's like, well, the only people who are ever on this trail are people who carry drugs. So how would you know to show up to a place where people carry drugs? You know, and that's, I mean, you can draw your own conclusion on that. Um, you know, so it gets frustrating, especially when you see them dragging young people down there and and telling them these fantastic stories on how they're saving lives and you know just making it a better world for everybody else and it's like well no you're you're facilitating drug smuggling and if you really wanted to help people like i lived in ajo arizona uh, little podunk town the only people living in that town were either federal agents um you had your local sheriff's de deputies uh, we were bordered in Indian reservations. So you had the people that thought, well, hey, it's, at least it's better being an Ajo than it is on the reservation because the Indian reservation wasn't really that nice of a place to live. And then you had your leftover mining families that just didn't leave when the mine closed. Well, it wasn't, uh, as a school, it wasn't a fantastic place. You know, it. we lived there, we enjoyed it, but... You know, I'd have kids come to my house. You know, they'd spend all day at my house. People that I didn't know who their parents were, but they came and they played at my house because we had food and we'd feed them dinner. You know, so if they really wanted to come and help, like, hey, there's, there were kids right there in that little community that, hey, they needed help. I had a girl that was in fourth grade that would come to my house every day. Um, and then she'd come during the day too when they're supposed to be in school and I finally had to lay down the rules of like, hey, you can't come to play unless you go to school. So then I'd get her to go to school. Um, and then we found out, like, just from them conversing with my own kids, like, she didn't know how to read. She couldn't read her own name. She didn't know her birth date. You know, she was in fourth grade. She didn't know her name. She did, I mean, she couldn't read. She couldn't read, her own, read or write her own name. She, couldn't, she didn't know what her birth date was. And we'd get her to go to school simply because, like, hey, if you want to come over and play and then have dinner, you got to go to school. You know, you and say you got these university people, they really want to help. There's there's people there that need help, but they don't come down for that. Um, from Arizona, so Arizona, I moved out to Imperial, California. So Imperial is the um, Calexico, Mexicali area. Um, <clears throat> in all these places I moved to and I lived in, there, there is a lot of mixed commerce. There, there's plenty of people coming back and forth across the border every day, doing it legally, doing it with proper documentation. Um, it, it creates a great economy. Um, it, it creates just it creates a fun environment to live in because it's it's cultural things that we don't see every day. Um, I know for like especially in California, a lot of people I worked with they would go to to Mexico for healthcare because it's cheaper. You go there to the doctor. Doctors were good. You know, dental work was good. Um, and you didn't have to pay the inflated prices because the people that were living there and working, they were living much cheaper. So a lot of, the, a lot of my coworkers, I mean, Border Patrol agents, they go to Mexico, go to the doctor. You know, and a lot of them had connections down there. They had family down there. There's families that lived on both sides. Um, <clears throat> but in, in that Mexicali area, we had, we had a larger fence. You know, and this was just shortly after uh, they made the big push to, to build the wall, which going back to, to Arizona, like we had, I had friends that I went to church with that were uh, Tohoto Odom 
Native American, which it's a pretty large reservation. Uh, it's one of the most oppressed uh, Native American groups. But the, the, the tribal members that I went to church with and that I lived with and conversed with on a regular basis, they wanted a wall. They wanted to see fencing from one end to the other. Um, and, and there was always that argument that you were, we were dividing because there's Tohoto Odoms that live on the Mexican side, that live on the, north, on the U.S. side, and we were dividing them by putting up a, a barrier. But they understood that by putting up a barrier, and we saw this, you, you, we, I saw this in, in Mexicali and Calexico, if you put up a barrier, what you're doing for the U.S. and the Mexican side is you're relieving both sides of the border from the influx of the traffic. Even if you're Mexican and you live on the south side, everyone who comes north comes through your property. The Mexicans want the Mexicans that live on the border. They want the wall and they want fencing just just as we do, because it does. It makes it easier to patrol. It it slows the traffic down. It pushes them outside of town so people can have houses and property on the border, without people constantly coming through. Because when people come through, they they will take and acquire whatever they need to survive. And sometimes, hey, that's whatever's in your house. There, there isn't a lot of regard for, well, you know, if they're going to jump across the border, they don't really care about going in your house. You know, if they're, if they're not respecting, and, and even with a fence and a wall, yeah, they'll climb it, but it at least creates a deterrent, and it creates, it creates an opportunity for Border Patrol agents to patrol and funnel traffic, and then more so even when they come across now there isn't the, the easy egress going back and sometimes it, i mean that's that's part of the deterrent if you're going to come across hey it's not just hey i can step across the line and then if i don't like it i just duck right back over well now you gotta get back over the wall and you got to be a lot faster to get up and over the wall than it is just a straight run you know because if i'm there if you're trying to go back up over the wall and you already crossed you're coming down you know, and it's and and so once they see that, it it slows it slows the traffic down. When, when I've demonstrated to them, like, hey, you're not going to get away, then they're not crossing why I'm there. You know, and and that's one of the issues we have now with what's going on with the border is there isn't the cost reward is is way out of whack. You have people that are coming across, and and I've interviewed, you know, like. I had my bio. I've interviewed literally thousands of people coming across. The number of people who told me that they were fleeing violence was less than 1%. The majority of the people coming across right now come across because they know that if they get to the United States, they will get stuff. Whatever that is to them, they are going to get stuff. If you come as an as an illegal immigrant into the United States and you are taken into custody by the U.S. government, all your medical bills are going to get paid for. And I have taken people to the hospital. I've taken them, waited on them. I've taken people with tuberculosis to the hospital. And that's why I got tuberculosis, which the federal government did not pay for. I had to pay for my own treatment because they said there was no connection to my job. <laughs> Despite being assigned watching the person with tuberculosis. So when we bring them to the hospital, th those bills are covered by us. I had one person in particular that I had, we took him to the hospital, he got a prescription. When we went to go get his prescription, we ha asked him if he had money to pay for his prescription. His response was, yes, I have money, but that is your job to pay for it. So in, in I got some, I gave us, talk this summer up in Decorah and I got some criticism for saying exactly what a person had told me because I was told by some of my Decorah friends that I could not possibly know what they were thinking or what their motive was because I had a position of power over them which you know <laughs> possibly I didn't I didn't ask them but it, it just the the idea that like hey I, I get what they're trying to insinuate but if if I have somebody in in what we drove usually 
usually what I was patrolling in, we call them dog catchers. I mean, it's, it's a three quarter ton or one ton truck with a big metal box on the back. And so if I can put somebody in the back of there and they feel comfortable enough to tell me, no, I'm not going to pay for my own prescriptions with the money that is in my pocket, you must pay for it. I don't feel like I have a position of power over that person. I don't think they're intimidated because they know it's going to get paid for. They know that I'm going to go to the pharmacy and we are going to get them their prescription. And that's, that, is, that is what happens. I mean, I've done it multiple times. I've seen it happen, you know, and it, it's happening every day. It's happening right now. Um, for, you know, we talked about kind of the difference of most of our Mexicans that are coming illegally that we are apprehending are going back. Um, occasionally, some of them aren't, and that's usually because they have, if they have minor children in the United States, um, until they get their final order of removal, they're usually allowed to stay. And part of the reasoning there is because the children are there and the cost of putting those children in uh, alternative care or turn them over the state is greater than it is to leave the parent. And with the parent there with the children, it's less likely that the parent is gonna abscond. We're, we're gonna have an address, we're gonna know where to find them. Um, most of our um, illegal immigrants that are coming from countries other than Mexico, um, and I've done this myself, and it, it's pretty much, you see it on the news now, it's not even hidden anymore. They come, we process them, we give them transportation to wherever they wanna go, which I, I've booked, when I was in Texas, I remember booking a bus ticket for an individual to go to Indianola, Iowa. And I remember doing it thinking, I wish I could book myself a ticket to go to Indianola, Iowa. Because for, for me, you know, like being in Texas, being in Texas was like being in a foreign country to me. I was like, I, I would really like to go home. You know, I'd been there a couple of years and be like, that'd be nice to take a trip back home. You know, but I'm booking somebody who's not from this country, who had no legal right to be here, a ticket back to someplace I would like to go. And, and we have two states that are shipping people north because there's more than they can deal with. And they're being criticized and it's like, well, we were doing that all the time. Like we've been buying bus tickets for these people. I mean, cause that was, I was in there, I was in Border Patrol for 10 years and I've been out. This is my fourth year out. So 14 years ago, we were doing it, you know? So it's not, it's not like it's new. Um, you know, at, at where we're at right now, like to, to bust them away from the border. I mean, most of those small towns are just are overwhelmed. I mean, Ajo, Arizona was a town of 3,500, uh, you know, in, Imperial, Calexico, you know, there's pretty good population there, 50,000 there. But when I was over in Texas, if you follow, once you get outside of El Paso, every town you'd follow down along that border, I mean, you know, at most three, 4,000 people in a town. And that's big. I mean, most of them are just a couple hundred. I mean, it's similar to what you're going to see around here. Like there's, they don't have the infrastructure to handle hundreds to thousands of people coming across. You know, so there isn't much choice other than to bust them out. Um, and I don't see, I don't see that changing. I mean, I don't see at this point with, without, without true enforcement of immigration law or at least have the cost of coming across has to be great enough where there's a deterrent. Um, and I've always questioned too, like, so many of these, so many of these South Americans are coming. I, I've yet to have, and that's one. I never had one come up to me either that was starving. Like I didn't have people coming to me that just, you know, just hey, they had absolutely nothing. They didn't have food. They didn't have clothes. They had nothing. I mean, they they have access. They have access to food and clothing. And I understand. I understand the desire to want to maybe the want to come and create more opportunity for your family or your kids. 
Um, but are they being told the truth of what they're getting into? Um, I know talking to some friends who are down on the border s still and still working in uh, other agencies. So when I left Border Patrol for a short period there, I was with Homeland Security Investigations, which is the investigative part of ICE. So I still have classmates that I went through the academy with, you know, and I've talked to them recently and asked them what's going on. And uh, big thing that they said that they've noticed is worksite enforcement has pretty much gone to zero. Like there's, we're not doing much worksite enforcement. So all these illegals coming across, you know, where are they going? Um, I know recently Hyundai Motor Group just got busted down, I believe, in Mississippi at one of their plants uh, employing um, minor uh, Central Americans. So they had a bunch of Central Americans that were between the age of 12 and 14 working in one of their plants, supposedly working for a contractor. Um, and that's, that's where a lot of these people are going. Again, I've booked travel, I've booked tickets and because they give us, they always give us an address of, we ask them, it's like, well, where are you trying to get to? You know, where do you have family? Where do you have somebody that, that you can go and stay with? And when, we, when I book them, I always pull it up on, on Google Maps. You know, you pull up on Google Earth and look to see, well, where are you exactly are going? And there's, I mean, Tennessee, I've sent a ton of them to Tennessee and shacks. And, and I, I lived in Tennessee. I lived in Chattanooga for a while. So I, you know, somewhat familiar with the area, and my only guess is they're they're working in probably processing plants. You know, they're uh, we had Postville, Iowa, which is uh, two of my brothers were actually born in Postville, so I have familiarity with that area. You know, Postville, Iowa, is still the largest uh, immigration bust that's ever been done in the United States was in Postville, Iowa, and. What happens in places like that is they, you may have you may have a couple of them that have documentation that are legal to work, and then you'll have a dozen of them that aren't. Well, you pay one that is, and that one that is then pays the twelve that aren't. So they're not getting paid fair wages. Um, so again, though, they're they're being essentially tricked into coming where there's work in Mexico. I mean, there's there's employment down there. I know people. I have a kid that uh, he helped us with the weight room up there in Decor, and his dad was Oaxacan. And he tells me a story about going back to Oaxaca with his dad, which, you know, Oaxacans are uh, south end of Mexico. When we ran into Oaxacans, we're always, again, always the nicest people to catch. Um, wouldn't let you carry their stuff. Like, they found it offensive for, for an official to, to carry their bags, which, as a border patrol agent, like we, we can't force the people in our custody to carry, you know, because sometimes their bags are pretty heavy. They have a lot of stuff that the Oaxacans would never let us carry their stuff because to them that was just like, hey, you know what? We crossed you illegally, but you caught us. Very, very respectful. Always addressed us as, as official. Um, you know, a lot of times they'd look down because they, they, they were submissive. Um, but so this person, this kid that worked with me, you know, his dad, he talked about his dad and going back to Mexico and when they'd go back, they'd always go and they'd line up work, you know, they'd go back and like, Hey, well, let's go knock a job out. Like, cause he was skilled laborer. He did concrete work and there's work down there. Um, so <clears throat> when they come North, it's sometimes you, you know, it's like, well, what are they coming for? Or who's telling them to come? Because um, that was something that, that I did see big shift between administrations was when Obama came into office, the, the people that were coming across changed early on. And, and there, wasn't, there hasn't been a big shift of change in enforcement up until this, the Biden administration. Now, now, now it's really to where... You know, border patrol agents don't feel supported. Um, they don't feel like their mission is is clear. Um, but when, Ob when Obama came into office, we did see this shift where they they see more the people coming across the border. They they were very aware of of the rules and the laws. Like we, I talked about expedited removal. Um, 
it had to be 14 days or less for us to do an expedited removal. Well, we would apprehend people, and they always like, oh, it's how long you've been out, how many days since you've crossed the border? 15. You know, just like overnight, they're all like, oh, 15. And it's like, well, I've been chasing you since you crossed the border. Like, w like we had proof and evidence of that person crossing the border three days ago. I'm like, 15, how you tell me 15? I, I know already what day you crossed on. I know where you crossed. And then, oh, yeah, well, it's only been three days. And it's like, well, why, why would they think to say 15? But every group we encountered, it was 15, 15, 15. It's like, well, it, it was pretty apparent, like, okay, so they've been coached. Somebody's told them exactly what to say, so that way it limits our ability to remove them. They, they, they know the system. Um, when I was out in California, California, we had a lot of uh, people from India, uh, Punjabi region. Every single one of them, every interview, same interview. They belong to one political party. There's another, another political party that, that they don't get along with. And five or six guys had stopped him and beat him up with their hands and fists. And you'd look at them and be like, okay, well, did you have to go to the doctor? No. Did you go to the hospital? No. Do you have any injuries? No. I was like, okay, so you got beat up by five to six guys. You came out with no injuries. So you must be pretty tough. <laughs> you know, and then they're like, yeah, I'm pretty tough. It's like, so you left because you feared for your life. Yep, I feared for my life. Because that's they got to have credible fear. I feared for my life. I was like, because you belong to this political party and there's another political party trying to kill you. Okay, yes. It's like, so are your, is your mom, is she still in India? Yep. So you were afraid that you're going to get killed because the political party you belong to, which is the same political party your mom belongs to, and you left her to die. It's like, what kind of person are you? You left your mom to die. You know, and, and same story, though. I've had that same story over and over and over again. You know, and it plays out the exact same way. But we have to go through that whole process of, like, well, they claim credible fear, so now we have to give them a court date, and they're going to go to the court date, and, well, they're not going to show up, which the numbers have shown that, like, they're not going to show up. <laughs> And, but those that do show up, they're not going to get, their, their claim is going to be found invalid. You know, and, and then, it's, okay, so what are we doing? What's, what's the purpose then? You know, the first, first time I did the, an, an immigration talk, talked about border patrol, like I, I, try, I try not to get too political. Um, it gets hard, though. You know, especially when you get, I mean, I've had people that, you know, I told you I had some people that were pretty critical of me after the first one. Um, and simply because, I, hey, I told them what my experience was. And, and my experience isn't, isn't based on racism. Like, when I lived in Ajo, we had, we had a family. Um, he, came, he came from Mexico. He immigrated from Mexico. He, had his, he was a legally admitted permanent resident. He did his paperwork right. His wife was, was a Mexican. He went over there, married her, um, waited until he could bring her across, got married, uh, did, did everything the way he was supposed to do it. You know, they had a baby on the way. They came to our house because we had, for, for Ajo, we had one of the nicer houses. Came to our house and had a baby shower and, you know, had 30 Mexicans show up to our house and... Had, had a great, you know, and most of them didn't speak English, and we had a blast. They came, they took over the kitchen, they made great food, and then at the end of the day, when it was time for, for those that needed to go back, go back, they went back. And, and it was as simple as that. Like, hey, everyone played by the rules. When I lived in, in Arizona, our school there, we had half our teachers were Filipino. They all came on visas. Because uh, you just couldn't get anybody to teach down there. It was... It just wasn't a very desirable place to live. Uh, they didn't pay great for, for that area. 
And so their solution was they'd get these teachers from the Philippines on visas. Great people, great families. Um, they really supported each other. They, they were great for the community. Uh, we did one Sunday a month at church. We would all get together, and most of them were Catholic, and I went to the Baptist church, but we'd all get together and we'd make a meal. We'd make a free meal for the community. Anybody who wanted to come eat, came eat. Um, and, and they were some of the staunchest supporters of immigration enforcement because they had to do everything right. They followed the rules. They did their paperwork. And, and they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They lived their life right. They were, they were, they were great people to have in the community. Um, you know, and then a lot of them ended up having kids in the United States, so then their, their children would become U.S. citizens because if you're born here, you get citizenship. Um, and they're the people that you do want to stay. But they followed the process. Um, and there were times where I, you know, other people I encountered were, I can understand where it would be nice um, there probably does need to be some reform of our immigration system. You know, like where we're at right now with employment, you know, why shouldn't somebody be able to come up to the border and seek, seek a visa to come across and find a job? I mean, I know in Decorah we got plenty of jobs that we could fill, but they need to be documented properly and they need to, they need to pay their taxes like everybody else. They need to pay their share and you know, they need to be integrated into the community appropriately um, and, and not, be, not be playing the system. You know, because uh, those that are playing the system, then, then they become dependent. You know, and, and that's, probably, that's probably a big part of the reason is, is dependency serves one political party a little more than the other. Um, but I haven't seen, I mean, and this was something that came up in my last talk is everyone asked, well, well what, what do we do about it? It's like, well, the immigration problem's been an issue for quite some time. Um, I haven't seen either political party really come up with a, a strong solution. Um, you know, I do think what Trump was doing, I think he was on the right, the right path. I think, like, hey, we got to secure the border. But he had, he had a Republican... Senate and Congress, and they didn't authorize they didn't authorize the funding for the wall like they should have, because um, that benefited everybody. It's it's infrastructure, you know. It's there, there's there's other infrastructure that can go along with it, and there's you know there could have been some some more road work that went along because there's a lot of uh, unimproved areas in there that communities that that need you know that need basic necessities like. Uh, better transportation, better, better internet. It could have been part of that package. Um, but, you know, if, if you want to know, like, hey, questions to ask, to ask your, your candidates is, you know, ask them what their plan is. Um, like, how many, how many immigrants do we want to have a year? Because we, we are a country founded on immigration, um, but that, that changes once you throw in now we have uh, we have a social security system so we weren't a country founded on social security so how many immigrants do we want to hear you know our, our candidates should be able to answer that you know wh how many you know what what is what should be the punishment for illegal entry you know, if we are going to reform immigration law, are we going to stiffen the punishment for illegal entry? Are we going to stif stiffen the punishment for overstays? Um, because they agreed. I mean, everything was done in writing. They signed off on it. They agreed to their terms. Why, why should they be rewarded for, for violating the agreement and the contract they signed when they came into our country? You know, what, what, are, those, what are those conditions? And those, those are questions like, I would like to hear from candidates too, rather than just kind of broadly saying you support or don't support something. Like, hey, give me give me some numbers, because there's there's plenty. We already have a pretty good idea of how many how many illegals are in this country, and what are we going to do with them? You know, what, what do they owe? What do they owe? If you've been in this country for 20 years illegally and you haven't been paying taxes, you owe 20 years of back taxes. 
because if I miss my taxes, I'm paying them. You know, so th those are those are things that you know. When I've I've been asked like, hey, well, what can we do? Like, hey, ask those questions, and find out, and get even even whether it's Republican or Democrat or Libertarian, like, you know, hey, come come clean and and tell us exactly what you support. If you support open borders, well, then fine, but at least say it. Say, hey, I support open borders for everyone. Okay, well, then we know where you stand. Um, anybody got questions? Anything I didn't clear up enough? I can, I'll say yeah. I can across the border, and I, I say it, and I don't know what you're going to but I want this. What are you all going to give me? Well, and that's the thing. Like, on, on the medical side, you're going to get, if you need to go to the doctor, you're going to the doctor. Even if you don't need to go to the doctor and you say you want to go to the doctor, you're going to the doctor. Um, and so that's, we had a bunch of them figure out too, like, because if, if you, if we, once we put you in custody, we're going to feed you probably a frozen burrito that we warm up in the microwave, a juice box, you know, you know, maybe some crackers, but at the hospital, they're going to give you a hot meal. So once one of you goes and you figure out like, Hey, you go to the hospital, you're going to get a hot meal. Then everybody's got to go to the hospital. And it, it's one of those, it's a game that if they if they say that there's something wrong with them, we're taking them to the hospital, and and you're getting checked out. Well, so when you come across like if I'm if I'm the apprehending agent, I, I'm probably more than likely unless it's unless I need to do a unless it's a prosecution like a prosecution is hey you're an aggravated felon like you already have a criminal record. Well, then I'm going to have to come back and I'm going to have to do paperwork because I have to put a case together and, and, and be very specific on when you crossed, where you crossed, what the encounter was like, what I found on you. Um, all your property, we inventory all your property. So if you go wherever you get sent, if you're getting sent to detention center somewhere, your property travels with you. Like it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily in your hands, but it's going to go with you. If... If you are, if you go back, if we send you back right away, we send you back with all your stuff. If you, we already know, hey, you're going to, like we look up your record and we know, all right, you're going to, you're, you're an aggravated felon. This is, you've already been ordered removal. Uh, we get a prosecution on you. Like if you have a criminal record, we, we may get you a, a significant amount of time in jail. Significant would be like five years. Well, because we're going to take you back to the station. We're going to roll your fingerprints. Um, we're going to run your records checks. Um, so we're going to, based on that, and more than likely you gave me a name that's different than the name that you gave the last time you came through, which was different than the time before you came through. So we're going to figure out which one of those six names you want to use today, you know, and then assign one to you. And usually it's whatever name was on your court record from the last time. Um, and that, that's, that's something, too, I've... You know, I've heard people like, oh, well, these people, like, they come across and then they get sent back to Mexico and they don't have any other belongings. Like, we have to inventory everything. If you come across with a can of tuna fish, we have to inventory a can of tuna fish. Like, we have to be very descriptive on what it is because otherwise somebody's going to say, well, I had something that you really didn't have. And that's, that's part of the game. I mean, that's part of, right now, the, the, the amount of enforcement, because I said, when I was in, I, I never saw us be any more than 20% effective. Usually, we're like 10 to 15. Um, these areas like Del Rio, where they're getting inundated with um, all these Central Americans, they, they're not getting patrol work done. They, they're spending all their time doing paperwork. Because me, as, a, as an agent, I have to do all the work that, I have to detail, like when I do an interview, I detail your, your journey. I ask you all these questions about where you started from, how you got here, you know, what cities you went through, what method of transportation you used. Um, I ask you questions about, you know, what was the largest town close to where you lived? Did you go to church? Um, so part of it's just finding out demographic and trying to get an idea of who the person really is. Somebody's buying them food, somebody's transporting them. 
Have you ever found out who's behind all this? Well, and that's it's like nobody comes through Mexico without paying. The cartels run everything. Um, so they're paying to come. Who feeds them? On the way up, I mean, on the way up, that's part of, it's just, I mean, it's like a, it's like part of their excursion. I mean, they, they're, they're paying 10 grand to be brought, brought north. I mean, once, once we get them, we're feeding them. You know, but, but they, they're usually carrying, they usually have backpacks full of food. Um, well, I, I have, I have these slippers made of carpet that I have, I brought, I got about 20 pairs of them. And I use them now with my, my high school kids. We do, we go in the hallways and we do sliders with them because they work, they work great. But you can buy them, you, you go into Mexico on the border, like, I mean, you basically you have shops that it's like, hey, this is your stuff you buy before you cross the border. So they wear these slippers, they put these slippers over their shoes because it breaks up their tread. Because I know by the bottom of my shoe, so if I see that, I see that in the sand, and then I go up 20 miles, I'm like, all right, there's the same person I'm looking for. You know, and that's part of how we, we figure out, like, hey, I know you crossed because that wasn't there yesterday. So now it's there today, and, okay, I know you crossed probably about 2 in the morning based on the amount of distance you traveled. You know, so we use that to determine, like, okay, I, I know how long it took you. I know which group you're with. I know... I know there's seven more of you out there. You say you're all alone, but I know there's seven more that are sitting in that ditch somewhere. Part of the ponderance of all these immigrants getting sent to is like California, Arizona, and Texas, number one. And number two, what kind of prediction rates and so forth are for the continuation for the uh, refugees, immigrants, whatever you want to call them? Um, I would say, based on what we're seeing right now, you're going to you're going to continue to see an increase because if there's no there's if there's no deterrent, if you're coming in and the the handouts are there and the the cartels are making their money too, so the cartels are doing a good job of marketing. You know, they're going to those they're going to those villages and those cities in south South and Central America and, and selling selling the idea of coming north. Um, so when I was when I was sending people out, we sent a lot of people to Georgia. Um, Tennessee, Tennessee was a big one. I sent some to Iowa. Um, we sent some to Ohio, Michigan. I mean, e any place where, where they can get plugged into to a factory job, like if there's a meat processing plant, you pretty much guarantee they're getting, we've got illegals going that way. Um, and. I don't see any reason why it's going to slow down. Uh, we didn't see any really slow down. Like I said, when I was in Imperial, mostly we were catching uh, in in the in town in in one particular area. We mostly pe catching people from that Punjabi region of India. Same story, same demographic. It was always males between the age of 18 and 26. Um, it was never women, and never anybody older than that, and everybody younger than that. Well, it's it Hyundai, Hyundai Motor Corp. I mean, they they've got them working in their plant. I mean, so there's Hyundai. Hyundai had some working in their plant. It's like how how do you end up with a 14 year old girl working in your plant and not be aware of it? So how do they verify? Well, they're not. So verifies Well, I mean, and that's to say from from the people I'm talking to that I that I know are still working with. Uh, ICE on the Homeland and Security Investigations portion, like worksite enforcement has pretty much been told to stop. Um, because the way worksite enforcement works is typically what you do is the first, your first step of worksite enforcement is you reach out to a business and you provide them with information on what their legal obligations are as an employer. So you send them information, you make contact with them, and then you'll give them six months, then you reach back out to them and say, okay, we would like to have all, a copy of all your I-9s. 
So then they're supposed to send you, they're supposed to send you all their I-9s and that, then you'll go through those I-9s and what you're looking for is you're looking for, you're looking for duplicate records. You know, how many of these people, these names of, of, of people that have been caught before? Well, I mean, you walk into an emergency room, you can't be denied, and we don't patrol hospitals. We don't, we don't collect, and that's... <laughs> well, because you, they know you, you're going to pay. So if I walk, if I, if I walk into a... Yeah. If I walk into a hospital, if I walk into a hospital and I don't have any documentation, if I walk into an emergency room... Based on recent law, I mean, what we have for law legislation right now, they, they, they have to treat. They can't deny you at the emergency room. How many pounds of marijuana can a patient carry that far? Um, so if, if you had, um, like on, on the larger end, 70, 80 pounds is what a pack would be. Um, Typically, in, in, and that's part of the shift, too. It used to be, I mean, when I was in Arizona, like that, that was, we'd, we'd run around chasing and catch, and get tons of marijuana. Um, you know, we'd, we'd get, it, it'd be nothing to get five, 600 pounds in a day. You know, if we're, if we're working hard, if, if I got to partner up with the people I wanted to work with, you know, we'd, we'd get five to 600 pounds a day easy. Um, you're not seeing as much marijuana come across anymore because we're growing so much domestically. Now it's, it's meth, it's uh, fentanyl. Um, and the, the real issue with meth and fentanyl is I can carry 20 pounds, 20, 30 pounds of meth or fentanyl in a backpack. And if I'm traveling by myself, because usually marijuana, you'll see groups, usually even a small group is six to seven, but you'll see groups of up to 14 to 15. Well, 15 people walking through the desert's easy for me to, to track. I'll, I'll catch, if there's a group of 15, I'm going to catch them. I'll find them because somebody's going to slip up. But if it's one person carrying 30 pounds of fentanyl, if you gave me 30 pounds of fentanyl and told me to get across the border and get from the border to Phoenix, Arizona, there's nobody going to catch me. How much does that work? Oh, fentanyl, you probably, I don't know what the current rate is, but I'm, I'm betting it's over $100,000. Uh, usually, if you're backpacking, you, that's your job. Yeah. Well, like your your backpackers, a lot of them, they're coming across and they're going straight back. If if they're if they're hauling drugs like that, they go back. That's just what they do. That's just what they do. Go back and forth. Yeah. I mean, they're they're making enough money where, I mean, I'm they were probably making more money than I was. Well, and that's, <laughs> yeah, well, so that's part of the reality, too, is, like, when they talk about, um, you know, like, oh, abolish ICE or, or you know, like, how, how these people live in the shadows, you're not going to get from this, from this country, even, I mean, in the last 15 years, you're not getting deported 
from the United States if you're here illegally unless you do something really, really bad. Like, there's nobody, I mean, like that, and unless they would have charged her with a criminal offense, there's nobody who's going to come pick her up. And that's, I mean, it, for, for us to, to for, for ICE to go get somebody, like even to, to, to put a retainer on somebody in, in jail, they're, they're not going to do it unless, unless there's an offense great enough to make it worth their time. Because it's it's the the immigration courts are so are so lenient and they're so they're just so overwhelmed at this point that that's that's not something they're going to look at, and that's where it is. And that's that's I mean politicians they got to they they've got to answer as to what, what does the line look like. You know, like our you know I said it, I vote I vote Republican I I'm conservative but at the same time like. I want Republican legislatures and, and you know representatives. I want them to answer like, well, "What are you going to do when when big business comes and says, hey, well, we need them?'" Because that's something recently. Like, so my parents, we, we own our own we own our own custom meat plant. So my parents were meat packers, um, and I just had this the other day. I had the superintendent of my school district tell me that we need. We need this cheap immigrant labor to do the jobs Americans aren't willing to do. And I looked at him, and I told him, I was like, well, wait a minute. That's not fair. You're talking about the jobs that I do. And then he tried to clarify by saying, well, I mean, you know, like, you know, like working in those meatpacking plants. I'm like, you mean like my mom and dad? Like, because that's what my mom and dad did. Like, those are jobs that we do. Um, when I was in Iowa City, and this was when I was still in the Border Patrol, um, I was down in Iowa City. We we're staying at a hotel down there, and there was a Popeye's chicken across from the hotel. So I was heading over to Popeye's chicken to go grab some, something to eat. Uh, a black guy came out of the back of the restaurant, and I asked him, I was like, hey, hey, I want your opinion. I keep hearing, you know, about we need all these illegals to do the jobs Americans aren't willing to do. How do you feel about that? He got pretty colorful because he was pissed because his job, his prior job where he was working before, he got replaced by illegals because they're working for less than what he was getting paid. You know, and, and that's, that's the reality too. Like they, when they try to paint this as a racism thing, like, hey, that, that guy couldn't, in that's probably the best job he's ever going to have. He's going to work in food service. He was doing good work. He was, I mean, I saw him hustling. I appreciated what he was doing. You know, but he got, he got let go from his other job. He got pushed out because they hired a group of illegals to replace everybody else that was working there because they, could, they hired him for less. You know, and... I, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. I, I would guess no. And you know, wasn't it a year or two ago that Governor of Iowa said that we were not going to accept yes. any illegals? Yes. Plane loads came into Des Moines. You yes. bust them up to Iowa. And you what the hell's going on in this country? <laughs> politicians lie. Well, and and part of that's like I I don't. She she can she can make a claim like that, I don't think she can back it up. I mean, the, the reality is, is once they're in the country, she can't, she can't say, hey, they can't travel from state to state. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how she could, she could enforce that. Um, Couldn't she sue the administration? Yeah, I suppose they could. I, I don't, and that's, the, the, that's getting to a political side. Like, I don't know how you, I don't, I don't know how that would shake out. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. You talk about the cartels, you know, financing um, drug trafficking and all that stuff. But can you speak to anything about child trafficking and what happens to the children that come across the border and how they get sold to other people that come across the border? So, what we did see, so I had a friend that worked in Deming and he was a supervisor there. And he. He was part of a group where they started doing DNA testing because we, we saw 
we saw this huge influx of it was always one parent with with the kid like you didn't have mom and dad you had you usually it was it was dad with kids well so they started doing dna testing and they started finding out like well the kids weren't weren't with the dad you know they, they, it wasn't like the dna was proven they they weren't actually a family unit because if they're a family unit they were going to get released and so they were either like you say they're either abducting kids or they were some of them were renting kids because they're like, hey, if I come across with this kid, hey, I'm going to get to stay. Um, so there, there is quite a bit of that going on. There, there is a lot of human trafficking going on. Like, it's not, it's not like, hey, you made it to America, so everything's going to be fine and dandy. Like, they're, they're coming here. They said the, the, the cartels control everything that comes across. They're not going to let something come across that they can't profit from. And I mean, it's. You, you see it. You see it in Mexico all the time. Like, until until we help them to reduce the the profitability of illegal activity, like there, there's no way their government's ever going to catch up to the finances the cartels have or the firepower the cartels have. Did Trump's wall help? It did. Um, it, it, any any physical barrier that you can put up gives. It gives the Border Patrol agency opportunities to do enforcement. Um, there's so many wide open areas, um, especially like I said on that Indian reservation. Like there's so many wide open areas where, you know, they're they're coming back and forth so easily that it's just it, we don't have we don't have the time we don't have the time once we see them coming across to actually get to them um, because if they see us coming, they're just running back south, and then they just wait you out. You know, because they know you're not going to stand there. They're not going to stay there forever. And not every agent is doing the same quality work as, you know, as the other. So it's, it's, they test you. They test you. They test you. They test you until, until they're like, all right, you know, we can get this one. Like, uh, I worked in Nogales, Arizona for a while. Um, and I would park my truck and I'd put my seat back because they would wait and they'd watch and, you know, they'd wait until they thought you fell asleep. So I put my seat back and I'd turn my mirror, and then you'd wait and you'd watch to see him coming over the back behind you, because they'd look be like, okay, he's asleep, and then they'd send somebody behind you. So you you'd position yourself and you'd do things to try to play the game too. He's like, well, I know, I know they're not going to run in front of me, and if they see me moving around, they know, hey, I'm paying attention. So you'd have to get real still, or, or you'd put. You'd throw your phone up, so you'd put a movie on. So if they saw a movie, then they think, "Hey, you're not paying attention," you know. So you'd you'd, you'd figure out what they're looking for, you know. And then you'd, you'd put those things up, and just like they would, you'd try to decoy them, like, "All right." And then and then once they it makes it so they can't figure out your pattern, well, then then they'll quit altogether. If they know, like, well, hey, this guy, yeah, I see he's looks like he's sleeping, but he's not really sleeping. Well, they're like, "Well, I'll just wait for the next one." You know, and for me, for that night, hey, that's a win. You know, if they know they can't get across when I'm there, then at, at least they know, hey, when I'm there, I'm doing my job. Yes, um, there, there's going to be places where it's challenging to, to, to get one in because um, there's some mountain areas that, I think the cost to get up and over would be too great. Uh, where I worked in West Texas along the Rio Grande, uh, because it, it's it's desert, so you get these floods that, I mean, you get floods that where you may have waters coming through that are 12 feet high, where it's dry, you know, four or five years straight, and then you're going to get a wave of water coming through so any any infrastructure potentially then just gets wiped out you know from from one rainstorm so there's places where it'd be challenging and, and you you couldn't do much but the the fence and the wall is mostly effective in your high population areas if you push them out into the desert into the more remote areas it gives you more time to deal with when they come across so you can you can detect and then apprehend. I mean, and we had other tools that, like we used predator drones that would do, 
do recon, but um, I know when I was in the patrol, uh, Department of Homeland Security had, I think, 12 of them. But we, we would, maybe two would fly at most at a time, and it's one of those, that they were effective when they were up, and they were a great deterrent. I mean, because once you knew what it was, because like you, you could hear it, you know, it'd just be kind of this slight buzz. You know, if, if we were smart, you could decoy them too, fly a cheaper one that just makes a noise and they don't know what it does. Um, <clears throat> so the, the wall and it, what's up now continues to be effective. I, I will bet that there's going to be more put up, you know. Um, there's still been some construction going on even with Biden in office. Um, even though he said it was all going to stop, I mean, he, they know. They know it's the most effective way. They know that it makes the border safer. It makes the community safer. Um, it makes the, the Mexican side safer. Um, because simply because you, when you take away that, you take away that incentive for the cartel, if the cartel doesn't have a purpose to use your property, well then, hey, you're in a better place. All right. Yeah. Could we use the military to control uh, Legally, I don't think we can. Um, so we do use National Guard, um, but they usually when they're there, they're, they're observation only. So what they'll do is they will, we, we can use them as, like, they can operate the, the Predator drones. They could, um, we use like these little mini blimps kind of, um, they can operate equipment like that, but they can't do actual enforcement work um, because it's, It'd be operating the military um, within our own borders, and I, I know the last talk I did, somebody there knew exactly what the law was. But there's there is legal there's legal pol there's policy on that, and like where the military can and cannot operate. 